Uh, hello, my, name's, my name is Pete Smith and I'm one of the neurologists at Davies and what we're talking about here is a continuation of the case that we were talking about earlier in the week, uh, which is Ollie, the dog that has tetanus. And we're going to touch on some of the features today that we need to think about and the specifically some of the medications that we need to use to try and enable, uh, enable us to manage the condition as effectively as possible. So I guess the first thing that we might want to think of with dogs with tetanus is the range of drugs that we can use because that's uh, probably paramount in managing the cases to try and reduce the intensity of the muscle spasm. There's a range of different drugs that we can think about using. I guess of the ones that you have most readily available in practice, um, the first one you might think of is acepromazine, ACP. Um, that's quite useful for two reasons. It will help to cause some muscle relaxation and it will also help as a tranquilizer, stroke sedative. Uh, so these dogs which are likely to be quite wound up and upset by what's happening, uh, it can help to calm them down quite a bit uh, and make them a lot more relaxed. So ACP is quite a useful drug to use. Benzodiazepines are quite helpful as well. Um, I'm thinking of drugs like diazepam and midazolam. Um, they have two effects. They will, um, uh, they will cause muscle relaxation and they'll also have the added benefit of causing mild sedation. And they do that because they act at GABA receptors. So I think you'll remember from a couple of days ago when we were talking about the way that tetanus uh, causes it, it, its effect on the central nervous system, it acts to diminish the production of GABA within the central nervous system. So if we're maximizing uh, the impact of GABA, we'll help to relax, we'll hyperpolarize in, um, the neurons and we'll help to encourage muscle relaxation. Um, diazepam is useful. Medazolam is probably a little bit easier because it's, it's something that we can set up as an infusion. And so you can tweak the dose as time goes by and you can make sure that you're using enough to cause as much relaxation as possible whilst minimizing the side effects. One thing you have to be a little bit careful with with benzodiazepines is that they can cause a degree of respiratory suppression. Um, so it's important not to use too high a dose, particularly in an animal like a dog with tetanus that might be having some difficulty in breathing. So they're good drugs to use, but you need to be aware of the side effects and make sure that we don't use too much. Other drugs that can be effective um, that you might not necessarily have on the shelf, but some people will keep them, are dantrolene. Uh, so dantrolene is a drug that acts to suppress calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if you go back all the way to your uh, physiology your notes or your physiology memory banks, you'll remember that uh, the coupling of nerve activation to muscle contraction is achieved by calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, reticulum and causing muscle contraction. And if you can block that process of calcium release, then you can diminish the contraction of the muscle. So even though the nerves are still hyperactive, the muscles themselves can become relaxed. So dantrolene is a useful drug to use. You can get it as an injectable form, uh, but it tends to be very expensive when you use it in that manner. So we have a tendency to use it as tablets. Another drug that's quite helpful and which acts in a different way is methocarbamol. Uh, this interferes with the polysynaptic reflex circuits within the spinal cord, and it acts to diminish the activation of the motor neuron cells. So it's, it's kind of acting at, at, at the site that's affected in dogs with tetanus. Um, and it, it, it's useful because it's working in a different way than some of the other drugs that you might use. So it's got a very wide dose range. We would tend to start off towards the lower end of the dose range, and you can, but you'll often find that you need to go up quite substantially as time goes by. If we get dogs that are particularly severely affected, then we might consider using drugs such as intravenous uh, magnesium. This is something you'd have to be a little bit cautious about using, and uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it unless you've got pretty ready and rapid access to being able to measure the, uh, the blood concentration of magnesium so that you can monitor it and make sure it doesn't go too high, because if you give too high a dose of magnesium, then it's gonna, make, uh, it's gonna cause toxicity and cause more problems than you're solving. But it's something that we might have as a fallback position if we're struggling to control the degree of spasm just using the medication that I've talked about already. One of the difficulties you often find with dogs that have tetanus is that as time goes by, they'll tend to appear to get worse. So often by the time that you see them, they still have tetanus toxin within their system. 
which is still getting transported to the spinal cord and, the, and other parts of the central nervous system, but it's not yet had its impact. So often you'll see dogs deteriorate despite the fact that you're using drugs to facilitate muscle relaxation. And so you often find that you need to use a gradually increased dose of the medication to control the severe spasm that you're seeing. So that's something to be aware of. Another difficulty that we have is a lot of dogs um, have spasm of the laryngeal and the pharyngeal muscles. Um, and that complicates things a lot because we're often relying on oral medication in these cases. And we also need to feed the dog. Um, so if you have a dog that has a pharyngeal or laryngeal spasm, what you might find is that uh, you need to place a stomach tube to enable you to feed it effectively and to get the medication into it. Uh, another important aspect of medication that you might find you need to use is um, drugs to interfere with uh, the autonomic nervous system. So as I think we touched a couple of days ago uh, on the fact that the disease doesn't just cause spasm of the um, somatic musculature, it will also cause um, overactivation of the, of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. That can have two effects. One, it makes it very difficult for the dog to urinate. Uh, so dogs that are affected with tetanus will often go out and they want to urinate and they can urinate a little bit, but because of spasm in the urethral sphincter, um, they can only urinate very small amounts at a time. So that's quite uncomfortable for them. So we would tend to use a drug like prazosin, which is a good um, antagonist of, uh, of the internal uh, bladder sphincter. And obviously the external bladder sphincter is uh, skeletal muscle and so that should be, uh, tone in that muscle should be reduced by the other drugs that you're using. In severe cases, um, dogs are going to struggle to urinate despite this medication. And so it's not unusual that we'll need to place a urinary catheter to facilitate nursing. So there's a lot of potential drugs there and also the fact that we're likely to need to have intravenous access to provide a lot of these drugs intravenously possibly a stomach tube to provide nutrition and oral, um, oral medication, and likely a urinary catheter to make it easier for the dogs to pass urine. Which I guess all brings us round to the other critical, impart, uh, critical component of nursing a dog with tetanus, which is to ensure that they get good quality nursing. And this can make a very big difference, um, a, a very big difference to how these dogs do. There's an awful lot of complications that can arise uh, because of this uncontrolled um, muscle spasm and seizures and the fact that the dogs can't get themselves up and move around. So you need to watch them carefully to make sure they don't develop pressure sores. You need to keep an eye on them to make sure that they have sufficient nutrition. And as I say, they often need a stomach tube to ensure that we can achieve that. They need to be monitored really carefully on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a risk of sepsis, partly through aspiration pneumonia, uh, partly through uh, infection of catheter sites, urinary catheter and intravenous catheters. Um, and so we need to keep a very close eye on them to make sure that they're nice and clean. They also feel a bit uncomfortable as well. So we need to spend a lot of time looking at, keeping an eye on their mouth, making sure they're not getting ulceration of the tongue, keep their mouth clean and comfortable to as large an extent as possible. You've also got to try and provide a nice, quiet, relaxed environment, environment for them. So ideally they want to be in a room where it's relatively dark, there's a low throughput of traffic, and we often put bits of cotton wool in their ears so that they don't receive too much auditory stimulation and make sure that we don't have any flashing lights or crashing noises or too much banging going on around about them because that can be enough to trigger them becoming very anxious and very distressed and it will increase the muscle tone and can cause seizures. Another component that we need to think about which is likely to require some medication is pain. Um, dogs with this sort of this severity of muscle spasm were often very uncomfortable. Obviously the most sensible approach to that is to try and act at the source of the pain which is the muscle spasm. So the focus is very much on using drugs to try and um, reduce the muscle tone as much as possible. However, you can't always achieve that completely, so it's, important, so it's a good idea to think about giving them painkillers as well. And we would tend to use drugs like paracetamol, which is unlikely to use uh, to interfere with any of the other medication that you're giving, as long as you use it at a safe dose. It's only a mild analgesic, but it can still help a little bit. And also opioids at a relatively low dose as well in some cases. You've got to be careful because you can exacerbate respiratory depression with opioids. Um, and it will also tend to increase urethral sphincter tone, which makes voluntary urination more difficult. 
But if you're in a position where you think you have a dog that's a bit uncomfortable, uh, they can be helpful because they're potent painkillers and they'll also um, augment the impact of drugs like uh, acepromazine and the benzodiazepines to cause um, to help to calm dogs down a little bit. Okay, uh, well, I, I think that I'm not trying to pretend that that covers every aspect of managing a tetanus case because they are complicated condition. It's a complicated condition to deal with, and there are an awful lot of things that can go wrong. Um, even though you think you have the medication correct, but it, it's the, the idea of this really is just to bring to provide a bit of a synopsis and give some insight into how we manage these cases here, and the sort of range of drugs that we think about using and and how we focus as carefully as we can do on the nursing, which is an absolutely critically important part of effectively managing them and getting them back on their feet. And if we get all of this right, it can be a very rewarding condition to treat because you'll see these dogs three or four weeks later and they can look pretty much back to normal in a lot of cases.